Good afternoon. My name is David Pyle, and I'm here interviewing John T. Parker, Jr. Right. And uh, today is June 13th, 2023. It's 1 p.m. So, so John T. Parker, I understand you go by Jack. That's right. My family all knows me as Jack. Okay. It's a funny thing, though. In the Army, I went in as my full name, John Thomas Parker. And then later on, we found out that my name was legally Jack. So I had to have it changed with a lawyer when I was 62 years old. <laughs> but this all started in Miami, Florida in 1926. That was when I was born. So you're from Miami, Florida. Then. Right. That's good. So, okay, that's a, that must have been an interesting time to grow up in Miami. No? Well, let's put it this way. I was born two months after a hurricane came through and almost destroyed my <laughs> 1926. Yeah, those were the very early years of whatever Miami and Florida, just in general, I think mostly well, swamp I'm lands. youngster, and then I was on up into Georgia and up to North Georgia and grew up in, the, in Atlanta. And uh, one time I was sent by my mother down to Florida, down to Miami to see my uncle, and I volunteered for the Air Force, Army Air Force at that time. Right. Then I came home and I still hadn't finished high school yet. So about three months later, it was uh, February, I decided I would not learn anything in school. So it'd be real smart to join the army. So that's what I did. And I uh, was trained in Florida. And then uh, after training as an infantryman, they sent me to California and I got on a ship. And of all things, I went by the and so the Diamond Head in Hawaii, and I thought, well, I'll get there someday, but I had to just wave as I went by. And so I was on my way to the war at that time, because it was 1945, and Japan had not been defeated yet. And so they put me on this ship, and we got as far as Anawita, and about that time, they dropped the bombs in Japan, and about a month later, they surrendered. So I ended up in the Philippines doing guard duty as an MB, MP, not an MB. Mm, okay. <laughs> but anyway, uh, we gave all our equipment to the Filipinos and then uh, stayed there for almost two years, drove a Jeep, had an MP van, and it was uh, really a tropical paradise if you were to go there these days. But in those days, it was as hot as H. Yeah. <laughs> And, and I came back to, and got out of the army. And then uh, about two, two years later, I was just joined the Army Air Force, well, actually Air Force Reserve in Atlanta. And so at that time, I, I was, had already been to a watchmaker school because my grandfather and two uncles were all watchmakers. So I waited until they all died. And then I went to California and studied to be a watchmaker. And then I got into this reserve and I was going to work on instruments. Well, I found out they were flying a lot. And so I ended up being an aircraft mechanic and sitting next to the pilot. And I'd come in with this bomber and he'd have me open the flaps so the engine wouldn't overheat. Because in those days it was propellers. Sure. All of them were propellers. And so uh, I was in there and Korean War got called up in 1950. And so we all, 3,000 of us in Atlanta, were sent to Tampa and then down to Puerto Rico. And all those guys running that base in, in uh, Puerto Rico, they were all sent to World War, to the Korean War. And I got to sit there and greet all the incoming aircraft. So I write them all up and all the problems they had. And then about, uh, Two years later on there, the commanding officer called me in. And he said, we're gonna send you to pilot training. I said, you're gonna send a staff sergeant to pilot training? I said, you're out of your mind. He said, you're going, here's the orders. So I went to Texas, I went up to North Carolina first, flew a Cub and a T-6, and then I got that part down. And then they sent me to Bryan Air Force Base, Texas, and I flew a T-12. 28, which was a big airplane. And when you'd come in to land, 
you've got those flaps, the airplane practically stopped. So you'd have to stick it on its nose like this to come in. So anyway, my instructor pilot was Gus Grissel, who later on became an astronaut. Right. So he taught me how to fly, and I was doing pretty good in formation and all this. Then I went home for Christmas, and when I came back, he said, you're a staff sergeant again. So he sent me to uh, North Carolina again, and I decided I'd have been in two years. And I'd had enough, so I got out. So I came back to Atlanta and sold automobiles and I sold different things. And then I thought, oh, this reserve is still a good thing for me. So I got back into it again. And then I discovered I was needed this nice wife I had just married. And so I said, you know, it's too hot in Chattanooga at that time. So I said, why don't we go to Denver, Colorado? Because that's where all these guys kept telling me in the Air Force that it's a good place to live. It's comfortable and beautiful. And so through this little talk we're having, I got to find out how easy it is to have a charm life. Because that's why I'm still here. And I'm 96, almost 97 years old, and I'm still amble, can get around. I can't hear you too well because the aircraft engines kind of did me in. But I'm still still here, and it's a pleasure to have you guys talk to me. And why don't you say something? Well, I'm trying to listen to your story, you know. <laughs> but an incredible story, you know. You sound like you <clears throat> did so many different things in such a very early age, you know. Yeah, and, that's right. Uh, had so many different opportunities like that. I'm really kind of surprised that the pilot training thing, you know, that they Me were too. that. Me And like, uh, uh, flying formation was great, and I thought I was going to make it. But the one thing they didn't teach me when in that particular t time was navigation. And the next step was jets. And so I was just ready to get in a jet, and they said, you've had it. You're going home. No. <laughs> well, that's amazing. So you, back to World War II, let's, let's go back there for a moment. You. You were stationed then in the Philippines. Right. Okay. And I was driving a Jeep and for this lieutenant. And kept wondering all the time I was there, when are some of these Japanese that are hiding come up out of the jungle? But they never did. Right. So, so life was good. Well, that's great. By that time, combat was pretty much over then. I think. Oh, yeah. I, just... I thought we were all going to Japan to invade. Right, right. That was, and then uh... they dropped the bombs. And so... We just got to go do guard duty, which was was easy. Sure. And I could handle it. Um, but you started out then in the infantry, though, as far as your basic right. your, your Infantry training. was, I was well trained. Sure. The thing about infantry marching in sand, it sure makes you grind away. Right. I'm sure. But fortunately, the war ended. As a matter of fact, Roosevelt died while I was marching back from the field. And so that was, then Eisenhower and all of them closed down Europe. And so here I, instead of going to Europe, I ended up going to the Philippines. So it was, I was lucky in a way. There was different tales, like there was one where a B-36 came into Puerto Rico. And the guy had came in, he was flying, and he did a barrel roll in a B-36. He was a captain when he did the barrel roll and pulled up a second lieutenant. Because <laughs> you don't roll a B-36. Right, right. That was, uh, I remember, <laughs> they didn't like that, huh? Nope. nope. <laughs> well, that's a pretty memorable thing there. For yes, sure. I'm sure it was. I did uh, fly in a B-29 and uh, I was, the captain put me in the right seat. We're flying over Alaska, taking photo mapping of the country. And he said, I picked up his mic and he said, Parker's flying us now, get your parachute. <laughs> so that was a good experience. I'll bet. That's it. Those are fun, interesting things to uh, hear about as well, for sure. Yeah. Right. So it's interesting because, you know, th that period that you were there, you know, and just going to the Philippines and between then and when they dropped the bomb, you know, I, there was a lot of uh, 
concern, I mean, in terms of invading Japan. Yes. You know, and whether to do that or to do the bomb. That's right. And uh, so, I mean, you were right there in that whole period, you know, and uh, and sort of anticipating that and uh, That's right. your unit, the whole shot, I imagine. Right. And I read afterwards that the Japanese with the kamikazes were just waiting for us to come in. Right. And they were looking for the emperor and they hid him. So instead of they were grabbing our guys and killing them, they were able to end the war, you know, for which they did with MacArthur on them. I can't remember the ship. Do you remember it? Do I? Or they surrendered? I do, the Missouri. Yeah. Yeah, they signed that treaty, I think. Yeah. Uh, the Missouri. Right? So that was amazing. They, and of course, afterwards, history is a wonderful thing you can read about because you participated right. in, in some of it. Fortunately, uh, I, I didn't get into the fighting part. I was trained for it, but I didn't have to. All the better. Uh, yeah, that's for sure. Right. Well, so when you got out, then you, you, did you did you ever work as a watchmaker? Then did you? Yeah, I did. As a matter of fact, got back to Atlanta and got in a jewelry store and got to fix the watches. And I got to sell down you know, silver platters, <laughs> silver vases. And nowadays, nobody wants so. Sure, yeah, it's true. <laughs> Watchmaking as well is a kind of a dying art form, I think, in a lot of ways, depending on the watch. But, that's uh, right. That's right. Yeah. You know, that's amazing. So it, it sounds like, and you did a lot, you, a different, let's see, I'm trying to think that, uh, so you say you sold cars for a while as well, oh, yeah. and different things, and then you went back and... and went to work for General the, Motors and on the assembly line. Really? And... Uh, and I hated that, and that's when I got called up for the Korean War. Right, right. I never went back to making automobiles, yeah. which was fortunate. So we, you were then in the Air Force. It was the Air, U.S. Air Force by that time, right. not the Army mm -hmm. Air Force, right? There. And then I did, when I decided to come to Denver, the thing about it was interesting. I was in the reserve, and I got in. I went back to work and forgot about the reserve. So uh, in the mail, about six months later, I got a discharge for the Air Force Reserve. Uh, well, how many years total did you have then in the service? Oh, I probably ended up about, oh, I'd say about eight, Is about that, eight years. Okay. And, mm -hmm. and then I'll say one thing for anybody that interested in the service. It was good for me. I grew up. Sure. Because these days, nobody's growing up the way you know, everything is changing. But we, we may have to go to Washington one of these days and clear up a few things. <laughs> That's a whole other conversation. Okay. <laughs> Probably we don't want to go there at this point. Okay, well, thank you for... <laughs> no, no, we're not done here. We're not done. I, go I can't go home yet. <laughs> <laughs> we're still going. So you say you came to Denver then. What, years did, what year did you come to Denver? I came here in 1958. And I had gone to work for Bosch and Loam Optical Company, learned how to make glasses then. And so then I finally ended up selling and fitting eyeglasses. And then I had an optical shop on Colfax, and you guys all know where Colfax is. Right. And so I did that for a while. And then uh, I'm just trying to get a little of my thoughts back. But, uh, I decided, my wife and I decided we'd been here long enough. She wanted to go to California. So, I'm, and right now, I wouldn't go to California if you gave me the whole state, <laughs> the way things are going. Yeah, yeah. But I fit eyeglasses here and out there in California. Where were you in California? It was uh, Dana Point is where I lived. And then uh, Irvine is where the company I was with. And I'd go to all their different optical offices. They had about, well, I'd say 25 offices. So every time somebody would have a day off or something, I'd go fill in. And then anyone would fit eyeglasses. And so it was a good life. And finally, I got to be about 63 and retired. And so since then, I have moved up to Prescott Valley, Arizona. And right now we're on a trip seeing grandchildren graduate from high school and 
Meanwhile, my wife had died after 58 years, and this nice lady was living in my neighborhood. And she came by and she said to her brother, you know, I like Jack, but he'd have to die for me to get his house. <laughs> so about <laughs> six months later, I asked her to marry me, and she said yes, of all things. So now we have a wonderful life together, and we get to travel and see Denver again. And, so, and her relatives, some of them are in Pueblo, and some are living here. So anyway, that's my, what I can tell you about my life. What do you do? Have children at all? Do you have any children? I ended up with two stepchildren, and with Alice, we have about nine grandchildren. Yeah, yeah that's great. That's uh, well. Anyway, it sounds like you've got a pretty good life together, you know. And you, you bet. And enjoy and driving. Right now, around. I'm suffering a little bit with my eyes, so she's getting to drive all the time, and I don't have to. Although I keep saying she makes a great chauffeur. Really? Okay. Besides being a great <laughs> wife. Yeah, so she's the driver then. Okay. Yes. At this recent tour that you've been on, have you been you you've driven that whole thing? Have you have you been? Uh, is that how you've been getting around? You've been flying to the various places, or? Well, I used to rent planes occasionally, and just fly over the different cities. Yeah, and, yeah. and I keep trying to get her to go get pilot's license. <laughs> <laughs> I'm <laughs> but anyway, uh, life's been good to us and good to me. Yes, um, so what about hobbies? Do you have any hobbies that you... Uh... Well, I played golf for a while, and then when I was about, uh, I was going to say, about five years ago, I was sitting in the golf cart. And my daughter said, what are you doing in the cart? And I said, well, I just gave up golf. That's <laughs> why I was in the golf cart. <laughs> and that was it. That was it. Yeah. And these days, I'm just reading different books. Louis Emo, I think is his name. And I've so far I've read 150 of his books, is that right? his stories. And so we've got a good life. And she puts up with me very well. And as a matter of fact, this eye problem I've got has made me have her drive all the time. Because when I turn around and look at things, I get doubled image. Really? Yeah. But right now, it's getting better. That's great. So you're getting care through the VA. That's why you get to meet me here at the VA. Oh, yeah. <laughs> That's great. So do, what about like in Prescott? Do you, is there a VA there? Do they have a yes, lot? Yes, I do. And they take good care of me. Yeah. That's great. Uh, although I, it's our problem, we ended up going down to Phoenix and they took care of it at that time. On this trip, my eyes kept bothering me. So I ended up here in this uh, Denver VA and they beautiful job they're doing for me. And so I want to thank you all for letting me go through this. Yeah, we're honored and glad to have you here. Thank you very much. Uh, that's for sure. But, uh, so uh, what about, you have any amazing once in a lifetime experiences that you've had either in the military or outside of it? Well, in the first that place, like leaving a profound in high effect school. on your life, pardon? Yeah. yeah, sitting in high school when I was 17 and 18, I was looking out the window. I wasn't studying. So the Army made me grow up. Yeah. And so it's helped me in life because I haven't given up on that attitude. It makes you grow up and take care of yourself, your family, and all your friends. I'm sure that. How was that like during the war, the early years of the war? You were just, uh, you know, a young kid probably. And, yeah. Uh, you know, and as it progressed, whatever, you know, you got closer to an age where you could join. And, That's right. Uh, but did that have a strong influence and impact on your life then beforehand? And uh, Only that I learned how to w go to work and yeah. be dependable and kind. Yeah. There's a funny thing about the Philippines. After I got there, we found a 26-foot cabin cruiser turned over on, at the shore. So my buddies and I took it, nailed some boards on the side, bailed it out, and we had our cabin cruiser in Tacloban, which is where, what's his name, MacArthur invaded. Yeah. And so we got to run around in the harbor where he had in, invaded with all our troops. Is that right? And so when we shipped back to the States, I had to get rid of the cabin cruiser. So I sold it for $500. Is that right? <laughs> 
Well, that must have been quite an experience there. Well, so back you... in the, those days, uh, five hundred dollars was an awful lot of money. Yeah, no, what a deal. Now it's nothing. <laughs> <laughs> That's true too. That's like uh so what do you let's see, what would you like more people to know about veterans and military service? What do you what well, are your you have to on? learn to do a good honorable job, take care of your friends and your buddies and follow orders. And it also makes you grow up and be, become very dependable. And that's, that's part of the service, I think. And right now, unfortunately, that isn't happening. We ended up with this virus thing. And I've got friends that got, got the virus, and then they get the, the shots. And one of my best friends, his legs collapsed. And right now, because his body started fighting the shots he got, his whole body is going to heck. And so it looks like he's losing his mental capacity, all from these stupid shots. But anyway, that's my, what I think about it. Don't take those shots. Well, yeah, yeah. Uh, there's a lot of controversy around that, I know. But, uh, that's a whole other conversation as well. Okay. <laughs> you don't want to talk about the Arizona politics and all that. And the... Oh, yeah. Well, they used to be Republicans. And right now, I think they're Democrats coming out of, what is it, Boulder? Yeah. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so let's see uh, what else do we have here. Uh Here's an interesting question. It's like, what are some things you missed about miss about the service, and uh, is there anything that you you're, you're glad to have left behind when you got out? Yeah. Well, I thought they treated us great. Unfortunately, under Vietnam veterans, they all came down on all these guys, but they were doing the job they were set over for. So, what else can you do? Help you do your job. When you're in the military, that's what you do. Your rights are somewhat diminished, but all you got to do is do what you're told. What would you like people to remember about your own personal journey, your, your legacy? You have a legacy, like your film. Well, I can't think of anything particular except be kind and uh, take care of yourself physically, so they don't have to take care of you. Right. And I think that's about it. Well, those are sage advice. Try to be a good sure. citizen. You've done a good job of taking care of yourself, you know, and you look in great shape for after 96 well, when years. When I asked her to marry me, the priest said, she asked him, how old do you think he is? And he said, 52. Well, I was 92. <laughs> <laughs> but anyway, uh, it's worked out well. She hadn't killed me yet. So. <laughs> Maybe after the interview here. Yeah, yeah. she's a sweetheart, though. <laughs> I just kid her a little bit. <laughs> and in the Korean War, I got to go to Puerto Rico while all these guys got shipped to Korea. Korea. Uh, uh, and so uh, I was fortunate in that respect because I've been a watchmaker and an aircraft mechanic. And then I did have some pilot training then. So uh, I came out of it in great shape and learned to grow up. It had a lot to do with it. Sometimes we need service so that we can grow up. Yeah, I agree. But, um, some kind of service, whether military or community, whatever, you know, as far as just, I think that yes. it's an important idea. It's like a part of being a citizen or something. That's you know, right, just, that's uh, right. That's, uh, for sure. Well, the nicest thing about this is that my kids, finding out about me. John Quincy Adams was my great, great, great grandfather. And here I'm still getting the same kind of hairdo that he had. <laughs> no hair. 